Hello. Thank you so much for making it through to our final session. If you've been with us right from the start, I definitely can see a few faces or a few names that have been with us the entire day. So that's brilliant. Um, cool. Well, while the rest of you are just filing in, um, welcome to the final session of Megacon 2023. Um, it's been a fantastic day so far. We've had so much great uh, sort of knowledge having been shared. Um, I'd just like to remind you that if you would like to support Megacon, uh, we aren't char charging for tickets this year, but we do have our coffee running and we are nearly at our target. So if you would like to contribute towards our cost for Zoom and our website, we'd really appreciate it. Um, hopefully you feel like you've had some value from today. Um, so our final panel is looking at new approaches to mega game networks and I'm joined today by John Mizon, Lee Yancey and Rob Grayston um, I'll be asking them to introduce themselves all in a, in a moment and um, if you do have any questions for our panelists then please feel free to post them into the chat and uh, we'll ask them um, unless they are just abuse at Rob in which case I probably won't ask those. Um, but yes, uh, so let's start with getting introduced to our panelists. So John, can you let me know um, who you are, what your Mega Game experience is and what your network is? Um, I am John Meisen. Uh, I've been running Mega Games since 2015 and I've been running uh, Southwest Mega Games since uh, 2016 as my Mega Game network. Um, so I've been doing Mega Games for sort of five or six years uh, with some lockdowns in between. And uh, I've been mostly running it as a self-organized thing by myself uh, in a part of the world where at least when I started, there weren't that many people running mega games. Uh, and I've been running them as a business. So I've been spending a lot of time to sort of make a living out of it. Um, it's not my only job, so it's not like a full-time job, uh, but it's, it's a little uncommon in that way that it's, it's being run. Um, run sort of for profits, so, so to speak. Um, and so that's me, that's Southwest Mega Games. Uh, I'll stop taking up so much time. <laughs> that's great, thanks. Um, not thanks that you're not taking up. Thanks for introing. Um, Lee, let's come to you next. I'm Lee, uh, I, run, I run Dallas Mega Games with a good friend of mine. We uh, started up in 2018. Um, he wouldn't stop talking to me about Mega Games. And I told him that, uh, it was clearly impossible to play one because they, 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 no one did them in Texas. Uh, and then we decided, well, what if we just did them? Um, so uh, since 2018, we've run about 15 games. Um, obviously, there was a, a problem with COVID, you know, um, but uh, we've uh, um, we started back up strong last year, ran like seven games last year, I think. And uh, we're we're running into running at full speed now and hoping to hoping to have a game probably once every six weeks or so uh, this year. Um, yeah. Wow, that's an impressive number of games. That's um, great and want to hear more about that shortly. Um, Rob, let's just come to you. Hello, everyone. So uh, I'm Rob Grayston and there we go. That's the, uh, that's the background bit out of the way. As you can see, I'm part of East Midlands Meg Games. Uh, we set up in September of last year, although I've been Mega Gaming since 2015. Um, we've been set up by some friends who just thought, well, there aren't many games happening in the East Midlands, and we're not necessarily so keen on driving at least two hours or getting on a train for however long with however many changes to get to a game. So we're running them here now. Um, we're set up as a community interest corporation. So we're basically a sort of charity business that's a not-for-profit. And we are aiming to put on four games a year in the East Midlands, but as Birmingham is not in the East Midlands and we're running a game at UK Games Expo, I guess we're also kind of doing a couple of extras here and there. So that's, uh, that's us in East Midlands Mega Games. That's great. <laughs> and um, if um, and for people who, who aren't aware, so we'll look, we've obviously got a lot of mega gamers in the hobby who are players. We've got um, various designers or people who've helped out with design or helped out with controlling games. Um, but we've got a relatively lower number of people who are involved in running networks. 
Um, so I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about what sort of work goes into running a network. And let's start with Rob, because you've, you've very recently set up East Mids and um, you probably know a lot about what goes, particularly in the early stages of, of um, setting up a network. Yeah, so I don't necessarily want to talk about other people's experiences, but something that people will notice is there are lots of different ways to run a network. So we decided that we wanted to have a setup whereby we know what's happening and there's written stuff. And as I mentioned, because we've ended up being a company, it's legal and there's documentation and people can look us up. But we just thought that would be the easiest way to handle money and things like that. The admin stuff that people don't care about when they're trying to queue each other or launch a leak. So um, basically, we want to be a community network that runs games for people, that makes sure they have a good time. But we also want to make sure that we don't lose the organizers' money. Um, we run pretty much everything. So if someone wants to run a game with us, we find the venue, we run the event, we get control, unless the person wants to bring their own control. Um, we do marketing. We, I mean, uh, as of our last run of Den of Wolves and our adaptation of the Very British Coup, which is a political mega game that we've converted to something called Coalition of Chaos, we also do design um, and component creation. So basically, if someone wants to run a game with these mega games, we will do it all. And um, that's a lot of stuff that goes into running our network. It is a lot of stuff, yes. Um, absolutely. Um, Lee, what has your experience been? And you're talking about running games, like, was it every six weeks? So that sounds like a lot of work. Yeah, it is an incredible amount of work. Uh, and it's largely on um, myself and my, my, my buddy. Um, we have a relatively standard... Um, um, set of control that runs mo most of the games uh, with us. Uh, we have some incredible uh, veteran players that have been with us for a long time. Greg, the, the gentleman in the panel uh, right before this, uh, has been to quite a few of our games. Um, and uh, I mean, yeah, we, we, do, we do everything for the games. Uh, we, uh, booking the venue is often the hardest thing for us. Um, finding the correct size venue for the game you're running, uh, that's not gonna run you too expensive to cover your costs. Um, advertising uh, I've done a lot of outreach to a lot of other like board game groups and um, you know similar minded people um, to try to grow our numbers uh, we've run a discord we try to keep our community active and engaged um, which was a particular challenge during COVID um, we advertise our games um, so far we only run games that we can find that are in a well-defined state so that we don't have to do a ton of design work. Um, we have made modifications to everything we've run, I think, uh, at least a little bit. Um, we've probably modified uh, Den of Wolves the least, John. Uh, it's a very well put together game. Um, uh, but yeah, we, we, we do a little bit of everything and it's, uh, it is a lot of work, but it's also become kind of the primary hobby that uh, my buddy and I share and it, takes up most of our conversation space in in a given week um and it's uh it's been it's been a lot of fun putting it all together but it is very stressful we actually took uh january and february off specifically to to de-stress from last year's splits of games after coming back from covid yeah sounds like a well-earned rest <laughs> um so, John, you are a little bit different in that you do a lot of the design for the games that, you, that you're running. Is it all the design for the games that you're running or like the majority of it? Um, and how does that work fit in terms of like the work that you do to sort of run the games versus the design work? Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting sort of side effect of being a one person network is you don't have the variety of games you get with a network that involves multiple people who are designers and want to design all kinds of different games. Um, so any original games I want to run, I have to design myself, which if you design a mega game, you'll know is a massive amount of work. Um, so it is a mix of trying to find time to design new mega games uh, and the standard sort of, as Lee was talking about, uh, a lot of sort of admin stuff to do with venues, researching new venues, securing existing venues, marketing, uh, like taking in signups, processing signups. 
um, and mixing that with you know the time you have to spend designing new games. Um, there are some sort of helpful things you can do. Obviously, one of the things I do is I'll run the same game multiple times, um, especially if it's in different cities or sort of every few years in the same city. Um, and that sort of gets a bit more get gets a bit more out of each individual game design. Um, and also I will have other people who have designed games come sort of guest host, run a game uh, under Southwest Mega Games. So sort of I'll I'll do everything for the event in terms of admin and signups and marketing and everything. Um, and they bring in a new game. So add some variety and take some work off their shoulders. Um, so yeah, so it's sort of a balance of finding how to sort things out like that. And then of course, balancing that out with other work that I have to do that isn't to do with my particular Southwest Mega Games network. Uh, but I mean, that's that's besides the point. But yeah, so it's like I said, it's balancing designing with admin, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. So we've, we have touched on this a little bit already, um, but um, in addition to sort of things we've, al we've already said, what do you think that your network does differently to other networks? And obviously you don't know what every other network, but just in general, what do you think that you've tried a new way that you haven't heard of anyone else doing things or um, that you don't think is that common? Uh, Lee, should we come to you first? Sure. Uh, I think I think two of the things that we do maybe maybe differently than most groups is I think we're incredibly active. I think we run more games than um, than I've seen most groups run. Um, and that is that is by design. We want to keep people incredibly engaged. Um, and it's but it does it does come to the cost of a little bit of our sanity. Um, you know, we go from running a game one day to the next day. Now we're trying to fill the next game already. Um, it leaves a little, it leaves very little time for, um, you know, reflection and, uh, and, and kind of just relaxing and coasting on some success. Um, but we try to alternate games so that we're not running the same thing back to back. Uh, and we, that way we can iterate a little bit on the games, um, as we go. I think the other relatively unique thing we do in the space is, uh, we sell tickets by role. Um, so we will put up a, a full role list and people will pick what role they want as they're purchasing their ticket to play the game. And I think I've seen a lot, I've seen most groups do a, uh, just you buy a ticket and then a survey comes out and, you know, you're kind of assigned a role. We, uh, we want to make sure that people are picking the, the specific thing they want to do. So the most engaged they can be when the time comes time for the game. And I think those are the two things that we do most differently than other groups. Yeah, and I can I can see that, um, you know, if you're running games that regularly, then cutting out the casting step of the of of the planning process. I mean, I personally cast my own games and I love that aspect of it, but I can't imagine if I was doing games that regularly that I'd have the time to sort of focus on doing that. And and, and so I think moving it over to the players in that aspect is, a, is probably quite essential. Um, yeah, yeah, we, you know, Casting the casting, I imagine it takes a lot of getting to know who the players are to get them into the right place. And while we have that with a, the, our core, you know, we see probably twenty five percent new play, new faces every game. Uh, and getting to know everyone at that pace is difficult. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, Rob, uh, I know there are a couple of things that East Midlands is trying that are a bit different. Can you talk about those? Yeah. Um, so in terms of things that we're trying to do a little bit differently, uh, obviously we've got the setup of the um, sort of community interest as, as a business. Um, so you can look us up on the company's house. And we uh, did that from an admin perspective. That's basically because money's coming in and we want to make sure everything's above board and basically it just seems a sensible thing to do um, rather than obviously lots of mega gamers already know each other but like having that extra layer of yeah this is feeling a little bit more professional perhaps was something we were interested in so along with that um, in terms of professionalism or maybe slightly more polished in terms of components and venues is something we've been trying 
because we're not trying to make money, which means we want to break even, but we're happy to make sure we've got a nice conference centre and there's tea and coffee, which is provided. Um, and we've got sexy looking spaceships for Den of Wolves, for example. Um, so they were very sexy looking. Yes. Um, but we also, I mean, that's just in terms of we want to make sure everything looks really nice. So people feel like it's a sort of a, just a, a, a good experience from that end, as well as looking after them from your control and, and game satisfaction perspective. But we also don't do end debriefs, which a lot of people uh, do in other games. But we felt as though there's enough time when you go to the pub afterwards. Um, and in terms of community building or player satisfaction, we thought that it was worth not doing that because you've had a game, high energy, you sit down at the end of it, you spend 20 to 30 minutes listening to other people's stuff, and you have no idea what that's about. We just wanted to get people to the pub where they could go and tell their own stories. And that's something that we do that some people aren't so keen on and some people do like. So East Midlands Mega Games approach. Yeah, I can imagine that being very divide. I mean, I was shocked when I turned up and there wasn't a debrief afterwards. Um, so um, it's interesting to hear that you've had people who love it and people who hate it. And I'm sure as you run more games, you'll get an even clearer picture as to how that's working out. So I'm very interested to hear how it goes after all your subsequent games you've got planned. Uh, John, what do you think that you do differently? Um, yeah, well, as I've already uh, mentioned before, obviously I run mine as a proper business. It actually sort of originated as a bit of an experiment. Uh, I was working a full-time job at an engineering company and I was looking to do something else. And I had a bit of savings that uh, built up that I could take a tiny risk on it and um, just decided to see if I could make enough of a living that I could devote more of my time to running mega games, which is something I really wanted to do. And when I was also working 40 hours a week, it was very, very hard to find the time to run mega games, especially if I wanted to run more than like one every sort of 18 months. Um, so it was about sort of giving me the freedom to have that time to work on that, even if I'm doing it all by myself, which was, you know, it was a lot, it was a lot more sort of, that was the only option back then. Um, so that, that does make things different. I think perhaps the fact that I'm, I'm making money off it isn't as unique as the fact that I'm doing it by myself. Um, I think a lot of other mega game networks tend to be either a small group or sort of more of a, a committee of maybe around a dozen or slightly fewer people, um, because you get a lot of benefits from that. You have a lot of people to share the workload. And as I've mentioned before, you've got a lot of different people who want to design mega games, providing new, different, varied mega games. Um, but uh, I think there are some advantages to doing it by yourself. One of them, obviously, it's just easier and more efficient. Um, one of the reasons I like doing it by myself is just because I don't have to stress about waiting for someone else to do something or stress about uh, sorting something out too late and someone else needs it for their deadline and I'm, I'm messing it up. Um, so I think that sort of helps. And it's just a lot easier to keep things straight and to make quicker decisions um, when you're by yourself. Um, but uh, there's a few other things as well. Like uh, I tend to, as I mentioned before, I run games multiple times, which I think is becoming more common now over the last few years. But uh, it does mean that, you know, once you run a game sort of two, three, four, five, six, seven times, you start to have sort of an iterative design process uh, where, you know, you can, you can really sort of trim the game down to, and make those tweaks and those feedbacks uh to to sort of really improve the game over time as you get that feedback and 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 learn more about how it tends to go in a way that you can't really if you're only running it once or twice which uh i think a lot of other mega games end up being for a variety of reasons yeah i can i for me in terms of my designs and stuff like it's a, it's a huge great big event and i do think that for to run these sorts sorts of things um whether it's four games a year or whether it's a game every six weeks you kind of have to re redefine in your head that a single game isn't like this huge, huge, enormous commitment that you are. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Rob's got a bit of a wry smile on, but um, sort of like it stops being like this big event that's like defining that entire period of your life that you're working towards it. And, and it becomes more of a, 
well this is this thing and then after that'll be another one it's more of a um like just reframing it ahead might make it feel more manageable yeah definitely i mean once uh once you start running like somewhere between six and ten mega games a year which is what i tend to average like it does become sort of uh, like the events just become smaller in your head as you're sort of like knocking out the actual details of what i actually need to be thinking about and then once that's done sort of deleting that from your brain and moving on to the next month and figuring out what you want to do for next month and you start scheduling it a bit better you know you start coming up with processes and spreadsheets and email lists and whatnot that sort of just helps you know turn that into more of a manageable job you know when you do something every day it becomes every day uh and so it does sort of become simpler in that sense but yeah if, if if you're designing and running your first mega game it does feel so huge in your head and it's 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 a strange feeling to sort of transition from that into more of a just sort of event by event basis way of thinking about it great um so possibly related to that or maybe there'll be some completely different ones um are there any sort of particularly big challenges that you've faced with your network um rob would you like to talk about that yeah, so uh, we're new and we're not super close to everybody else. Um, although I understand that the Australians and the Americans kind of laugh when um, I say something like that. But it's it's a thing. Uh, there's a lot of people who will not travel out in certain areas, <clears throat> London. And um, I thought I'd just yeah, mention that basically uh, we are starting a little bit from scratch. We had some great support from experienced gamers for our first game but we are wanting to build up a local mega game scene um so we're basically trying to grab people and go look this thing's amazing come to our games and then once they stop hitting us or tasted us then um we hope that they will turn up to our next game so that's that's probably one of our biggest challenges at the moment yeah, and I'm, I'm sure all networks experience that sort of thing um, early on. But John, you've been established for quite a while now. Um, so I assume, is that no longer a challenge for you? Are there other challenges that have arisen? Um, yeah, so I mean, definitely when I started, it was a big challenge. I also think as Mega Games have sort of steadily been growing back in 2015, 2016, it was even harder to find people. And I started off in a place that didn't really have any mega games going on. That's why I started running them because I'd have to move to, I'd have to travel to London to go to any mega games. Um, so, uh, but it has gotten easier. I will say that it's only really gotten significantly easier in maybe the past couple of years. Um, until then, it's still been a massive amount of work for doing marketing and because i'm by myself obviously any marketing or admin or anything else i have to do to fill games up i've had to do on my own which is as i already mentioned one of the things that makes doing it by yourself a little bit harder um and the other major challenge as i've mentioned is designing multiple mega games but as i said i run the same mega game in different places or with different variations or i bring in guest hosts or, or occasionally sort of get someone else's design uh, and run that game and uh, i think lee mentioned he does something similar where they 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 buy a lot of games off the shelf to give themselves some more variety which is something you can do if you don't have a huge network of people running games yeah so lee sort of somewhat separate to the obvious challenges that come of running games on such a, a very regular basis are there any sort of less obvious challenges so i don't want to i don't want to like take rob's answer but um Texas is pretty big and not very densely populated. Um, we actually have uh, several of our core group live probably like four to six hours away from the game. Uh, we have a gentleman that will fly in to Dallas uh, for every game uh, that he plays in. Uh, so like our, uh, the population density is, is, is an issue over here. Um, we, um, so you know to reach out to people in in these other in these other cities that are big enough to have statistically have people interested in this it, it, it's it's it is a little challenging to find new players that way um luckily um dallas has a, a massive um uh, nerd culture and we can get a lot of people from local sources but you know we have um 
actually there's two people that fly into our games we we just pick one up that lives in colorado like two states away um other than that sourcing sourcing good games for us to run because my buddy and i've tried to design games and it just hasn't gone well for us yet so sourcing good games for us to run is um it's a challenge um because when we spend you know the money we spend on the licenses we want to be able to pick that game up and run it without having to um for lack of a better term finish developing it um you know there's a lot of times where you'll get rules and um some of the rules have maybe only exist in the designer's heads and they don't think about them because they run them all the time and it's perfectly understandable but it's stuff that it's stuff like that that we have to kind of go through and and almost kind of mock play a game before we run it um you know it with with just our control to try to find those questions that aren't answered um obviously covid was a challenge for us um it took a lot of the wind out of our sails we had we had started going you know we had started our cadence up pretty well and then covid canceled actually two of our games were canceled and then we tried to come back mid covid and uh, one of our control got covid so we went ahead and took that as a sign that that one was too soon um and we made a decision that we weren't interested in online games um as a group um we felt like just for our experience they they were lacking something something of the heart of it that we we thought it would be better to wait until we could be in person to do them again to to really do that those are probably the biggest challenges we face yeah that all makes sense and I, I don't think you're going to be the only group that was significantly impacted by um covid i was involved with pennine at the time and it and for a lot of groups in, in the uk i know it sort of brought everything to to quite a abrupt halt until um online games started um popping up in some places but um related to covid we there's been the suggestion that sort of post COVID sort of people have left certain social networking sites and um, people are just sort of communicating slightly different ways, but also people are valuing their time in different ways compared to pre COVID. Now, um, now I know Rob, you uh, weren't around pre COVID, but um, for those that were, um, how has COVID affected how you've been finding players to come to your games, how you've been promoting them. Um, have you seen anything different since then? John, would you like to start? Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of the promotion I do, because I don't have uh, much money to chuck into marketing, it tends to be sort of word of mouth based or social media based. And I've definitely, as you said, sort of seen a lot fewer people using Facebook in particular since uh, COVID um, and However, I think there were some Facebook, and this maybe is getting into conspiratorial territory, but there were some maybe some Facebook software changes that were happening even before COVID that just made it less effective, like fewer people were seeing things when you posted them. Um, but uh, it hasn't really changed things in any significant way. All it's really done is sort of change the platforms people are on online. So if I'm reaching out to sort of a local board gaming group in the area where I'm running a mega game to spread the word, um, you know, it's just, well, are they on Facebook or are they on a Discord server or are they on Meetup or are they using uh, a, a Reddit or something? And uh, I know I sound like I'm 100 years old when I say a Reddit. I just couldn't re remember what the Reddit thing is called page. I don't know. Um, anyway, so they, they'll probably just be on some social media platform and you just have to figure out which one it is based on whatever online presence you can find. Um, I think I have seen a few more people signing up since COVID and uh, it's really hard to tell why that is. It could just be random anomaly because I haven't run that many games post COVID. Um, so it's hard to tell if that's a consistent pattern or if it's just, you know, you know, I have, like I say, an anomaly. I think if it's anything, it's like you say, maybe people valuing experiences more as people have sort of been thinking about that. Uh, I also wonder if the number of online mega games has, and I have no evidence of whether or not this is true, but it's a feeling I have, the number of online mega games has really spread the word in a significant way, sort of connecting new and different communities that are sort of very otherwise dispersed and that otherwise wouldn't hear about it 
just the existence of online mega games has reached out to those communities and they've they've heard about it and then of course the word spreads by that word of mouth and whatnot from there and just sort of has an exponential effect so that's sort of my theory about that yeah, that's an interesting thought to think that people over the sort of two year period when mega games weren't really happening, um, pe but people were still hearing about them. Um, maybe, hopefully, some of them by the end of that period still wanted to come and attend them in person and might. Yeah, that's the other thing is like sort of a build up effect, right? Where there were people hearing about in person mega games for two and a half years and just couldn't play one. And those people kept hearing about them and couldn't play one. And then after it's all gone, you sort of let the let the water flow out. So that's that's another thing that maybe could have been what's happening. Yeah, uh, Lee, what do you think? Have you found um, similar things to John? Uh, actually, yeah, I think I think our our experience has been fairly similar. Um, there were a, a, a bunch of people just chomping at the bit to get into a mega game um, once COVID ended, and then people people I feel like I agree that are wanting to spend their time differently now. You know, instead of just killing time for lack of a better you know phrase people are wanting to spend the time well because they've recently had that free time taken away from them and not been able to use it so they're wanting to have go out and have unique experiences which the mega games can offer um another thing that we've adjusted since covid is we've tried to take mega games to people in a way and we've we've started going to local conventions that aren't necessarily um, about mega games or about gaming. Um, you know, we've, we, we went to a, um, well, one of them, we went to board game. We took a, we, we ran a game at board game convention, um, at BGG con, and that was very successful. Uh, obviously that that's a very targeted audience, but we've run it at a couple other local conventions, um, here and here around the, the, the Dallas area and just getting people walking up and saying, Hey, what's that? and getting a chance to actively engage those people that are curious while you have the entire game laid out in front of you to demonstrate what what's going on is a is a neat experience uh, that i think has helped us build um more player base uh, in the really post covid world so did you say that you're taking it to cons that weren't necessarily even gaming cons yeah, so like, well, not not board game cons, right? Like right. board games is the closest analog, but we've gone to some all-purpose cons. We've talked to like, there's a big anime convention in Dallas. We've talked to them about running there. Um, we haven't done that one yet. Um, QuakeCon is run in Dallas, a big video gaming convention. Um, we've had some feelers out with them. We're, we're trying to go to adjacent uh, areas rather than direct, um, you know, the, I mean, the big, the big con in, in, in the U.S. is obviously Gen Con, right? Um, and honestly, we have no plans to go to Gen Con because the saturation of people that could actually come to our games is very low at Gen Con. Uh, if that, if that, it's a little selfish, maybe, but that's kind of how we've looked at it so far, especially with as busy as our schedule is. Yeah, no, that that totally makes sense. Rob, so you've set up since since COVID, obviously. Did you approach it any differently based on um based on your experiences? Uh, I don't think there's been anything COVID specific that's come out of it in terms of just getting players to games. Uh, I think that that's something I could go on for a quite a while about and how mega gamers aren't always the most effective at marketing. And I think that um that would be a fantastic panel next year but yeah just talk to absolutely everybody um student societies larp events.co.uk other mega game groups local magazines and press radio facebook groups local friendly gaming stores board game cafes absolutely everyone you can get hold of contact them tell them about your game and you might end up with like we've just had a student society said hello can we have 15 tickets please yes yes you can so it might take a lot of time and effort and you might think, why am I doing another spreadsheet on publicly available information? Um, so, yeah, it, but then that happens and you think, oh, no, sometimes the crying about this pivot table has paid off. And I, I completely agree. I will happily talk to anyone at any great length about mega game marketing. So maybe we should do that panel next year. So one quick thing I would mention is uh, just in case anyone's here who is involved in the network and doesn't do this, 
have a mailing list. Mailing lists are helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Need to own that data. Um, so, um, what ideas do you have for improving your network? Either ideas that you are planning to implement or ideas that uh, you think sound good, but there's possibly an issue with doing it. Um, Lee, do you have any thoughts? So our, our biggest idea for improving what we've got going on, and it's been something from day one, we want to have our own dedicated venue. Um, we want to control the space that we run games in. We want to find a way to use that space outside of when we're actually running games that will continue that will grow the community. Um, it's something that we um, we uh, it's something that from day one we've discussed um, because venue is our biggest hurdle. Um, it's um, it's just something that's uh, that is always a consideration. You know, there's always a problem with the venue you go to. There's you never have quite the control you want. You never quite have the um, it's never perfect. So if we owned the space and could control it, the, we could make it perfect. We could invest money in PA, in TVs, in you know tables, and we could really make it a premium production um, up, up to the standards we want to run at. That sounds absolutely incredible. I think a mega game venue would be a great idea. Is that something that you think is feasible to do as as your group or is that more of a pipe dream because i think in the uk like it's been it's been bounced around by various people and i think just it just the property prices would just make it completely untenable um we have a we can do it uh it is possible um it, we're just not there yet um and we need I'm to wondering. we need to finish we need to figure out something to do with the other 29 days of the month right yeah. um essentially and we would need to we would need to also put on at least one game a month if we were to do it but we're it's something we are actively working towards that's incredible let me know when you do manage it because i am coming to that game in the <laughs> official mecha game venue that's fantastic absolutely cool uh john have you got any thoughts um yeah so interestingly uh sort of my plans for the future in terms of improving my network is a little unconventional and that I'm I'm trying to run fewer games um it, for one thing I think uh it's just like as I said it's not my only job and I'm you know I'm seeing if I can spend more time with other work so that I can sort of let the games I'm running sort of have more time to breathe um, and hopefully, you know, if I'm running fewer games, I can spend more time in designing new games, which I feel like I'm sort of falling behind on, really should be getting some new games out of the pipeline. I, you know, I had two and a half years off and I didn't spend it wisely. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so sort of trying to spend less time running games and more time designing games. Um, but I think one of the other things, uh, you know, which I think is boring, but true is just that after you've been running games for six or seven years, you know, you just notice a very slow but steady increase in sort of the level of experience you have, the level of experience your regular controls have, um, get, getting better at game design through just putting games out there and, and getting feedback every time. Um, so it's just sort of like a, a slow, steady increase there. Um, but yeah, so like I say, I'm trying to run less games because one thing that's often remember, important to remember at the end of the day is Mega game networks are run by people, sometimes a very small number of people, and they have other things in their lives. And sometimes their next step is to reduce the mega game output, which seems counterintuitive sometimes. You're sometimes expecting grow, uh, networks to just grow and grow and grow. Uh, but sometimes the opposite is true. Speaking from like the small but perfectly formed Megacon 2023, which is a lot smaller than um, 2020 one i think it was our first year it's not all about growth sometimes it's about the focusing. perfect example so something's about fo focusing on on what you do best and what you enjoy when it comes to things like this rob you are still quite early in east mid so what are your plans for future how do you want to improve uh steal things from everyone else that have worked and not touch the things that they've done that haven't um so obviously we just basic stuff. Listen to what people want. I would love to do a Russian Civil War game. I think it would be great fun. 
I don't know if everyone around here wants to do that, and they might want to do the Space Eurovision Galactic Band Battle game. Fine, great. Do things that other people want. Don't just do what you want if you want people to come to your games. Um, I really like what uh, is Melbourne are doing, which is mega game mixers. Have a social. We're lucky in Nottingham, geek capital of the UK, Europe, maybe the world, because we've got so many different gaming people here. And I think we could just have a social where a load of mega gamers come along and it's just, let's go to the pub. Let's talk about mega games. Let's talk about design stuff. It's informal. It's a bit networky, but also it's a bunch of geeks talking about mega games, having fun. Um, control school. That's something loads of people want to do. I know that uh, it's been done in a semi-professional capacity for some um, some people, where basically it's training people in facilitation skills for professional and serious games. Um, and then obviously encourage people. You've got an idea for a mega game? Great. Tell us what it is. We will support you. We are here to help you with that. So in terms of improving the network, basically everything. All at once. Yeah, that sounds great. Honestly, the Mega Game Mixers idea sounds really good. And I wish that I lived. I mean, London definitely got a big enough Mega Gaming community and that they could do something. But I guess the downside is that London is so big, so they're probably also quite spread out over it. But I wish that I I was close enough to a network that I could go something like that because I think that sounds really great. Okay, so um, last question from me is how do you think Mega Game Networks will change and evolve over the coming years? Um, do you think that what we're looking at now is what they're going to look like in say 10 years time or do you think we're going to see any sort of significant shifts? Uh, John, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, I um... I think I, I, I struggle to answer this question with any sense of confidence, uh, partially because uh, I'm not super active in sort of community forums or anything when it comes to mega games. So I, I really have no idea what other mega game networks are doing and how they're changing over time. Feel free to let me know, but uh, I just don't know. Um, but uh, I think one thing that probably is changing just based on sort of what I've seen is that uh, especially since COVID, we're seeing a lot more familiarity with online platforms. So Discord servers is a great example, but also, you know, things like Google Documents, where you can have a document that anyone that's a member of a team can see at any time. Um, and I think that kind of stuff is probably just going to help with networks communicating and sorting things out and working on things communally. Um, especially if, you know, they're not based in exactly the same location as each other. Um, so it's harder to meet up in person. Uh, so I'm hoping that just in that sense, things will just be objectively easier to run because people have these sort of online options to network and communicate and organize. Um, so I, I think that's, that, that would be my thoughts. Yeah, increased communication, better workflow. I think that's, that's really, um, that's almost certainly true. Rob, what are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I don't have a crystal ball. Uh, I don't know what technologies are going to come along and change things. People keep talking about implementing new digital features to mega games. Don't know how that will change things. Might make things easier. Might mean that we have a magic AI that means we can run a thousand person game with only one control. Um, but otherwise, I think a bit of a little bit of extra polish. Um, will help move things more in the direction of escape rooms and some of the interactive theatre like Crisis What Crisis and Talking in the Country um, basically move slightly more towards a mainstream audience, which means you capture the uh, basically more people in the same way as Dungeons and Dragons isn't just a geek thing anymore. It's widespread. I mean, we are basically inheriting the earth, which is something that I kept getting told, but I don't appear to have my minions um, yet. Um, improved marketing. I think that's something that I, I'm happy to talk to people about marketing. I'm not a guru. I don't know everything, but just consistency, which is something networks, I think, need to get better at. Um, and then I guess semi-professional elements where sometimes we do just get hired to do a game because a company wants a team building exercise. I think more of that. I know there's already some people who do that. Um, I know people who have been doing facilitation professionally. Um, but I think that as we have the skills, 
more and more people, especially in terms of business continuity after the pandemic, are now saying, we want someone to run us an exercise or some kind of training. And you don't need to be an expert in that, but we need someone to keep it all going. So I think as people develop those skills, they'll find those contacts and that'll be a bit more of a thing. Yeah, yeah lots of great points there. Um, I think in particular, um, the, um, the professionalism of it, and I think we might see a bit more of an overlap between professional games and you know especially with with what East Midlands is doing by increasing the professionalism of sort of just the games that you're running um we might see more games and going into that sort of more mainstream thing I would really love to see like the games head that way and if groups are interested in pushing it if networks are interested in pushing it that way then I think that's going to be what might drive it Lee coming to you last any thoughts on how change it networks are going to change and evolve so if I had to if I had to just put money on the table and say this thing will happen for sure, I think we'll see groups um, split along the online in person divide, and I think we'll see dedicated networks to online games show up, and that will make <clears throat> the games that everyone runs split. Um, I think uh, so. You'll have mega games that won't work in person, and you'll have mega games that you know. That, that can only be run with Discord bots and and, and a um a back end uh yeah Omega uh a back end control um uh, system behind it, uh, and I think that'll give a I think that'll give a, a lot a very interesting experience to to see that that divide happen, uh, and then I think we'll slowly grow as a as a hobby. I mean, Mega Games is still very much in its in its infancy as a popular hobby, right? Uh, and I. I I think it will continue to grow relatively steadily. I don't, I don't personally foresee a huge breakthrough in the few in the next few years of popularity, because it is so still so niche, and many of us inside the hobby find it hard to describe still what exactly a mega game is, um, and how to. Uh, yeah, you're, Rob's laughing. Um, it's a, it's a question that comes up a lot, right? And and almost no one has a great answer for it. Um, so until we can answer that as a hobby, I don't, I don't think we can really expect a giant breakthrough in uh, popularity, but I think we'll, we'll slowly grow. I, I don't know if I completely agree with you there, because I just think, you know, no one was expecting the shut up and sit down video to have the impact it did. <clears throat> and a lot of these sort of leaps you don't necessarily expect. And it just takes the right game and the right audience at the right time and suddenly something's gone gone viral but i don't think you can predict it so it might happen in the yeah. next year that's, it might happen in 30 years time who the hell knows that's absolutely fair i mean no one expected that video to to i mean and that video is why dallas mega games exist essentially um my buddy saw it and like i said he wouldn't stop talking to me about it <clears throat> um and uh honestly just to annoy him i've never watched that video Oh, no, you have it's, to watch it. <laughs> no, it's a point of contention between me and him. I just, I refuse at this point. <laughs> oh. um, but yeah, it's, uh, and, and I, I've, I've used that video hundreds of times at this point to sell people on the concept of mega games, but just, just as a point of contention between me and my friend, I refuse. That's hilarious. We've had some, some great thoughts in the chat. So Barbara has suggested that three hour games could make it more accessible and that, that we are seeing more and more of these um kilo game kilo game style games existing and um that could be something that makes it more accessible um and paddy's also pointed out that omega is already doing a lot of online games and we might see i, I believe omega is the main group doing online games but we've got a lot of different groups even groups that are located in similarly similar geographic areas um running games so having additional groups who are running games online lots of you know competition in some ways is really good for encouraging growth and encouraging um innovation and change and more um more awareness and things like that so it would be really interesting to see if uh we do get that divide that you mentioned about online versus um versus face-to-face -face games 
Um, I think I did just see one more group, one more question up here, it was a little while ago, um, for Lee, which was um, that Greg mentioned um, on the previous panel that you've got a patron and how you find that as a tool for keeping your audience engaged, because I don't think I've heard of other groups <clears throat> having a patron. So we debated uh, seriously whether or not we wanted to do the Patreon. Um, it was really contentious between myself uh, and, and our control group. Um, we decided that it was probably going to be worth it, um, not so much for the extra income as so much for the letting our players support us and feel like they were feel like they were buying into the, to, to the idea of the group. Um, it's it and it's worked out very well so far. Um, right now, we just have a single tier, which lets them get into a different Discord channel that no one else can see. Um, and that Discord channel has generated um, a lot of content for the group, uh, a lot of good ideas for the games, a lot of new players coming in because the people that are that dedicated to the group um, and get rewarded for being that dedicated to the group um, tend to be the people that bring a lot more people in. Um, we've given, you know, we've, we let that group design their own merchandise with our branding on it. Um, we let that group um, have input on what games we're playing next and what, you know, when the next game is. Uh, actually, one of our one of our Patreons actually chose the date for our new venue um, or for our, for our next game. Uh, they, they chose the date for it. Um, so it's, it's actually worked out incredibly well. Um, we're working on expanding that to have a few more tiers and a few more rewards, but it's been a very positive experience for us so far. Uh, and sorry, oh, I'm sorry. And and Gre I mean, Greg's one of our Patreons, and he, you know, he's he's one of our biggest uh, he's one of our biggest evangelists, essentially. That sounds like a really really cool way of getting buy-in from players, because a lot of players who aren't necessarily associated with the organization of a group will will identify themselves as like members of a network um so i think that's a really cool idea john rob do either of you have any thoughts on um using something like patreon um not something that's been considered uh i don't know how effective it would be in the uk market but then i just said uk market and that makes me feel kind of weird because we're in this, still in a it's a hobby but some of it's feeling a bit more professional space it's like the old world is dying, the new world is yet to be born. Now is the time of monsters that make it and make it games. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've I've never seriously considered a Patreon, um, especially as obviously as a profit making organization. I'm already making money from the ticket sales. Um, I, I don't want to be sort of double extorting all the players or anything. Um, but I think I've considered it not just because of sort of financial, but you know, there are people out there who say, I like to support people running mega games. And I think as Lee's pointed out, there are people who think like, oh, I'm part of XX mega game group community um, because, you know, I, I go to some or all their games and I know a bunch of the people whenever I go. Um, I think it is nice to formalize that in one way or another. Um, and, you know, if it works for you, I think Patreon is, is a decent way of doing that. Um, or like you say, just giving them sort of a unique community space to exist in if it's sort of a Discord channel or, or something like that. Um, so I, I think that's worthwhile sort of getting a place for your community members who see themselves as community members to sort of support you either financially or, or by any, any other means, you know, with their ideas or suggestions or feedback or, or just sort of good community vibes or whatever it may be. Yeah, I mean, we've we decided to do a coffee for this year one, when we decided that we um, weren't going to be doing ticket sales because we obviously still had costs. Um, and I do think that there is a place for um, that sort of support because, you know, a lot of these are hobbyist endeavours and but a lot of them do cost money and finding other ways to engage with players who are enthusiastic about it and want to support it, but can't support it in the way of um, contributing like designs to the hobby, but wants to do it in other ways. But I think that's about all that we've got time for. And I'm gonna use this as one final opportunity to plug that we have a coffee. And if you have enjoyed our, um, our talk today, including this final one, then we uh, would really appreciate your support on there. 
Um, but thank you so much, John, Lee and Rob, for all of your um, thoughts and ideas about your networks. It's been really fascinating to hear the different ways you're all doing it. And especially that there might be a Mecha Games Dallas venue. I love that. That's fantastic. Um, it's it's hopefully coming. It's it's hopefully, but it's 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 years. Yeah, it's years. Yeah, it's, it gives me time to save save up the airfare to America. So that's good. there you go. <laughs> cool. Um, so just to finish off the day, so this is the end of MegaCon 2023, and uh, we hope that you have enjoyed uh, however many of the sessions that you were able to join us at today. Um, the, all of the sessions have been recorded and we will be um, sharing them on our YouTube page within the next week or two, um, depending on how long it takes to edit everything. Um, and um, the Discord channel, uh, the hashtag the pub, will be remaining available for anyone who wants to share further thoughts about anything that has been discussed during the con or at any point related to Megacon. Is there anything else I'm forgetting to, oh, I need to say thank you to the other people who've helped organize Megacon because um, Chris and Ed and myself have been uh, organizing um, the con. Hopefully you have enjoyed it and a huge thank you to both Chris and Ed for all of their hard work in bringing today together. Um, is there anything else I'm forgetting to plug? I'm looking at the chat. UK Games Expo? Yeah, sure. I'll plug UK Games Expo. Um, why not? Um, UK Games Expo is taking place the first weekend of June and we are going to be having three three mega games taking place there. And I can't remember the order of them. Rob, do you remember the order of them? Uh, I believe it's Den of Wolves on the Friday. Uh, yeah, Den of Wolves on the Friday because I'm running that one. Then it's Aftermath on the Saturday, which is Zane. And then it's going to be Event Horizon. Yes, based on that film. Uh, run by Johan on the Sunday. Yep, and we are also hopefully going to be having a mega con, a mega sorry, a mega gaming stand in the main hall as well. So if you are in the UK and want to come along and say hi, even if you can't make it to any of the games, then please do. There'll be more information about that shared uh, once all the details are finalised, I'm sure. And um, Barbara has asked me to plug the coffee again. Yes, if you would like to support MegaCon. Um, by donating five pounds so that Chris, Ed and I can go and buy coffee or to fund this Zoom license, then um, please do. And um, the link is in the chat again. Yes, but finally, thank you um, to all of our fantastic speakers from across today, all everyone who's sat on the panel, everyone who's posted in the comments um, in the chat, their thoughts and their ideas. And thank you just to everyone for making Mega Gaming such a fun and interesting place to have as one of your main hobbies. Um, I've really enjoyed today and I hope the rest of you have as well. Thanks everyone and goodbye. Thank you. Have a lovely evening everybody. Bye. Well, evening for the UK. Yeah, have a good one.